because of this chaos business. And I'll show you examples. Now, uh, I just alert you to, because this is a lecture I've given many times to many audiences, I may choose to skip certain pieces of it in order to keep the flow going. But I encourage questions if you have any. Uh, and why do we care about this? Uh, nature is inherently nonlinear. And we're dealing here with systems that can become chaotic because they are nonlinear and because we don't know, cannot measure all the details of the input. For students, this can be a challenge because all of their experience, almost all their experience in high school and college is based on linear systems, that is systems where you can count on superposition of effects and, uh, and so forth. And it's not until, uh, for example, a physics or engineering student would take a class on uh, dynamic systems that you would encounter this kind of nonlinear behavior. So here's an example of a, cha a chaotic system. This is a, a double pendulum. Uh, there are plenty of ideas out there on the internet of how to build your own double pendulum. And the, the idea is that no matter how careful you are when you start the double pendulum, you can never get the tip of the pendulum to trace out the same curve uh, that's being traced out right now. Because a small change in the input, regardless of how small, will ultimately change how the pendulum motion evolves in time. To talk about the a, a, a typical way to approach this and explain it is to pick the logistics function, which I've, I'm showing here, which is, as you're about to see, is just a parabola. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a function used in population studies and a variety of other things. But it's it's simple and it's manageable and it will give us a foundation upon which we can see how chaos can enter a system. So what we're seeing here is that if we make a measurement, our first measurement, where we'll call it uh, n equal to zero, the very first thing we measure, we put it in this equation, we have the, uh, the whatever the measurement is, we multiply it times one minus that measure. We have a factor R, which I will explain, explain, and that predicts what the future, one step in the future is going to be like. And then we would take this result and put it back in where X, where it says Xn here, we would take the Xn plus one result and plug it in and get a new result. And so we would be iterating through this equation to see how a system behaves where n essentially is uh, reflects time in the system. And I, I have some examples. I'll show you how this works. I'll ex also explain what R is. So <clears throat> here's a, a graph we're going to use many times in this talk. And we're saying that we're to keep things simple and, and explainable, we're going to limit the value of whatever we're measuring x, we're going to limit it to from some minimum value of 0 to a maximum of 1. And it's pretty easy to see that the peak of this curve, this parabola that we've defined, the peak occurs when x equals 0.5. And if you put 0.5 here and 1 minus 0.5 here and multiply them, you get 0.25. And so we allow this value r to be as big as 4 not bigger. That way, everything we're going to talk about is confined to this, this square grid where we have a, a range from 0 to 1 on both axes. Now let's talk about what R represents. And to do that, I'll introduce rabbits. Let's imagine we have a pen and it has grass or some other rabbit food and has water. It has no predators. And we're going to put a pair of rabbits in there. And we have a different expectation if we come back, say, three or four months later and want to count the number of rabbits we have at that time. 
we can have a different expectation depending on how interested the rabbits are in raising a family. If they're mildly interested, but not really enthusiastic, we could assign a value of R equals one. This is represents the reproductive success. I mean, they might be interested, but if there's some fertility problems, they, they might have a low reproductive rate. A eager pair of rabbits who have good uh, biology would, could be dramatically more productive. And when we would have two different outcomes, if we come back a few months later, we might find eight rabbits come from this, or we might find 64 rabbits if the rabbits are particularly eager and healthy. So we can now, just for the purposes of this part of the conversation, assign this axis here as being the population of rabbits that we will find where one represents the maximum population that can live in the pen without having the, the population crash because they eat all the food or drink all the water and they're just their survival rate is affected by the limits of their environment and the vertical axis here represents the production rate that is how successfully they're producing offspring so this is the logistics function and it's a parabola i've just explained all this stuff like i said uh, if you want to read this at your leisure you'll have access to the, the lecture notes now I've talked about rabbits here, but many, many systems have and can have chaotic behavior. And the time, the way time is built into this, this iteration time, might be years if you're studying moose reproduction, or it might be microseconds if you're looking at a, an electronic system that has some potential chaotic behavior. Now, in order to do experiments with this environment that I've described, without doing a lot of math, we're going to exploit this, this graph. Here's the logistics function. In this case, I've set r equal to 3. So remember, uh, at the peak, x times 1 minus x is equal to 0.25. If you multiply it by 3, you get 0.75. So, you will see a lot of different curves like this during the, my presentation, some that peak down here, some here, and so forth. The blue line helps us do the iteration part of this, that is the recursion, where we take one output and feed it back into the system to get a new, in, uh, to get a new output and then feed that back. Rather than doing that algebraically, we're going to do it graphically. So let's start by picking a value called A, and we're going to figure out what the output of the system is if we start at A. And the way that works is we put the input here, and then we go vertically until we strike the logistics curve. And now I'm just going to start referring it to the, as the red curve, because we have a red and a blue curve. So if we start at A, we'll get some output depending on how the red curve has been set up. And that's what this represents. We pick the starting point and we have this output. Now we want to use that output as the new input. And one of the things we benefit from by having the blue line is the point at which this first arrow touches the red curve provides a starting point for figuring out what B is without doing any math. We just have to go over to the blue curve because X and Y are the same on the blue line. So in order to see how the system is pro pro uh, progressing, we pick a starting point A and then we go over to B without doing any math. And at B, we can get the next result by going vertically to the red curve. And so what we're tracing out here is 
the history of the progression of, if we're talking about rabbits, this is how the population of rabbits progresses. We just have to keep drawing these little arrows vertically and horizontally. At this point right here, something new happens. So far, all the arrows have been under the red curve, but now the nearest point on the blue curve is above the red curve and our trajectory changes. We start going around. Remember, any result we get from the red curve, we take that point, go to the blue curve, and we are doing the recursion calculation defined by this equation without doing any math. And what we find here is for this particular choice of r equal 3, no, and by the way, this doesn't matter where we start. We started here, but we could have started here, and eventually we'd be in this area here. And if you just, you can imagine as we continue to add steps in the process, we're orbiting around this point right here. Now, r equals 3 is a special case. I'm going to explain why in a few minutes. But this is the basic approach that you start with any value you choose. In the case of the rabbits, this would be how many rabbits do we have? If we started with two rabbits, we would start down here and we just watch the reproductive process. And if the reproduction rate of the rabbits is characterized by a three, the population will go into orbit around this point right here and will stabilize. We're going to see some more examples. Uh, by the way, I've done this up to 10,000 iterations. I have done the math. And what happens is this box that's getting smaller and smaller here is gradually homing in on a value of 0.666. And you'll see after 10,000 steps, the, the trajectory we have is somewhere between 664 and 669. And no matter how many steps you use, you just keep getting closer and closer to this point here. And we can show why. I'll show you that in a minute. Now, let's, let's talk about values of r less than 1. That means the entirety of the logistics curve is below the blue curve. So there's no place where the red curve is above the blue curve. In the previous case, the red curve was above the blue curve. So now we're looking at a rabbit population that's marginally interested in reproduction. And even if we start with a lot of rabbits, remember one represents the maximum population that the, that the rabbit pen can tolerate. Even if we start with a lot of rabbits and they are disinterested or unhealthy, we go up to the red curve, we go over to the blue curve, down, over, and uh, you can see we're going to end up with zero rabbits. So I've zoomed in on this area, and what happens is we go over to the blue curve, the blue line, down to the logistics curve, over, down, and gradually, you, if you come back a year later, you will have no rabbits. And you can show, this has to do, we don't have to go into this, but you can show that because the slope of the logistics curve, in this case, for r less than 1, the slope is less than 1. Remember that the blue line has a slope of 1, so the red curve has a slope less than 1. If that's true, your population will eventually die out. So, so far we have nothing chaotic going on. Now let's look at a case where r is between 1, which would put the peak here, and 3, which puts the peak here, and let's see what happens here. In this case, we, we can calculate where the system will settle down, where the population will settle down, because the equation of our blue line is just x, and the equation of our logistics curve looks like this, and we can do a little algebra, and we find that they intersect when x equals 1 minus 1 over r. So if we pick r equals 3, this ratio becomes a third, 
And if we sub subtract a third from one, we get two thirds. And indeed, that's where the two curves intersect, right there. That's 0.66 on both axes. All right, now let's take a look at some examples of what happens for bigger values. Here's the trajectory for r equals two and a half. Regardless of where you start, but you have to start somewhere, so I started right here. You go up and over and up and over, and eventually you settle in on a single point. That's what this red line represents. You get to a place where there's no difference between the red curve, sorry, here it turned out blue, but between the straight line and the curve. You eventually get to a point where they're exactly the same. All right. Now, let's raise r to, instead of being below 3, let's put it up to 3.2. Now something interesting happens. Regardless of where we start, we will eventually settle into a box where you just go around this box, around and around and around, and you never leave. So we actually have two, a boundary between the two red lines. Here we had just one single point. The system will settle to a single point. If the value of r is 3.2, your system will oscillate between these two boundaries. So if this is your population, you, and you come at random times to visit the rabbit pen, you might have this a, a number of rabbits this small or a number th this big, but the population is oscillating around. Now let's raise the value of r even more, from 3.2 to 3.5. Now we get something even more interesting. We get this nested box. That is, if you start here and go in here, you will bounce around. Eventually, you end up on this, this box here. It goes around like this, and over and up and over and down, and it's a repeating box with four stability points, one, two, three, and four. So something's happened as we go from this situation to a larger value of R to a larger value of R again. And this is what you get if R is close to four. This pattern never repeats. This is chaos. If you come and visit the rabbit pen, you could have this few rabbits, or this many, but you could never know uh, if you come on a random visit dates, you can have any population between these two boundaries. And this is what is called chaotic behavior, that the input, <clears throat> the fact that you started with maybe one or two pairs of rabbits, now the, the input and the output are not, this, are not connected causally. There's just total randomness here. Now I'm going to change and I'm going to show you a video of this process. Uh, make, now tell me, are you seeing a, a new window open up? Yes. Okay. So I'm not, now I'm going to start the video. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to have a low value of R first and gradually make it bigger. And this, you're seeing me playing with the cursor. This is, I recorded this because it's tedious to watch me do this. But you can see as this progresses and we start, when it's finished, there are a little red dot appears. And, it, and what I'm illustrating here by placing, let's, let's stop this for a second. What I'm actually showing you is regardless of where I start, I end up in the same place. For example, in this case, I started here. We have a large population of rabbits, and it jumps around, and, did, 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 and I don't know if you can see that. It's a little red dot there. The system settles to that point. It's very predictable. Let's try another one. Same thing. I started over here, but I get this. Now we're going to raise R, and I'm going to try different input values, and they all go to this little point right here, regardless of where I start. 
So this value of R gives me a predictable, stable output. If you were a rabbit rancher, you would like this because you want to know how many rabbits you can expect to find. Let me stop it again. So if I start here, I very quickly end up at this point. If I start here, there's more activity, but eventually I get to this point. And as I say, if you're a rabbit rancher, you'd like to know, if you leave the rabbits alone for six months, how many you can expect to find. Now we have a range of results, because the R value has gotten bigger. And... What's that? Was there a question? Perhaps not. Okay. So you see how this works. We go around and around. Now we're going to raise R even more. Very close to four. And we have chaos. So there's something about the R value and the stability of the system that what might make you nervous as a rabbit rancher because you'd never know how many rabbits you were going to have when you came to visit. Okay, let's put this away. And let's go back here. So I hope you're, you're appreciating now what we're talking about. We can control the stability of the system or the amount of chaos it exhibits by choosing one value, namely R. Here's another way to look at it. I've done some experiments with using a spreadsheet where R is two and a half, you always get this result. Oh, this, oh, by the way, this horizontal line represents 10,000 uh, increments and iterations of the logistic equation. Nothing strange here. You always get the same output. If you put in R equals 3, which I've already shown you, eventually you get a splitting between two values, but those two values are asymptotically approaching 0.666. They never get there, no matter how many iterations you do. Here's the case for R equals 3.2. You get two values, and they don't approach each other. And 3.5, you get four values, and they don't approach each other. And this is what you get for R equals 3.7. You get just random outputs. We even have one value down here. But the values are confined in this region. They're just jumping all over the place because the system is exhibiting chaos. Now, here's an elegant way, not my invention, but an elegant way to illustrate how the behavior of the system depends on the R value. Ed, can I ask a question? This, Please. This, Greg Kopp, you, you keep talking about them being random on the output. Are they truly random? That is, would they qualify as a uniform random number generator? The answer is no. I, didn't. I, I, I should be careful about uh, let's go back and look at yeah. something like that. This is not truly random. Right. It's it's there's a Chaotic. causal there's a causal relationship. That you can make this in this mathematical presentation. You can make this repeat, but th these just appear random. It just appears like this. Right. You. I, I'm saying random in the sense that you could not predict the value you're going to encounter, uh, but thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Okay. Add something small to that? Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe you'll talk about this later, and I, I'm sorry for giving away the punchline, but let me say the easiest sense in which it's not random. If I know the, the, the X value at one time, I have a pretty good idea of what the next one is to within some some bound, depending on how precisely I know it. But but in fact, if I plot all pairs of one value in the next, 
they come from the formula you had and and they're actually lots of, and, and so that you you can get tests for randomness that they will clearly fail mm -hmm. right right yep yeah Th thanks for clarifying okay um all right so let's do this uh, let's talk about this uh what i consider to be a very beautiful diagram here's the r value and we're starting at 2.4 and for the output for values of r up to three no matter what value you pick you get one output and it's very insensitive to the ch the value of r that you've chosen i mean there's a slight change here not much but something happens when you pick an r of three you get a splitting you get an upper and lower bound to, in the case of rabbits, to the population. And the population will be bounded by these upper and lower limits. And that situation persists until you get to 3.45. And now we have another bifurcation. And now there's four values that I showed you earlier where you have the system is bound by this upper and this lower, uh, this upper and this lower case, but also can settle into these cases. But it's always moving between these four levels. No other levels are up here. And if we go up again to 3.54 right here, instead of having four stable levels, now we have eight. If you draw a vertical line through here, you'll see you encounter these, these splittings eight times. And you can see that just by looking at the numbers I've listed here, three, 3.45, 3.54, the closer you get to four, which is the maximum we are using in this experiment, the more splitting you get and the more densely the bifurcations occur. Also, notice there are, there's a place here where there's a narrow white slice in which the value of R can change, but nothing changes in terms of the bifurcations. And then there's a period where you have many bifurcations. Now, you can't see this yet, but right here, there's structure in this gap. And I'm going to show you that that structure looks like this whole graph turned upside down. That there's a whole nother realm in this range of R values where bifurcations are occurring for just the tiniest changes in the input. Hey, Ed, uh, yes. can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I've, been, I've been playing with this while you're talking and um, I'm noticing for the range up to 3.0 that the closer you get to 3, the longer it takes to settle down. Ah, yeah. Is, is there something you can say about that as well, or will say? Uh, I didn't intend to say anything about that, but that is true. It takes more iterations to get to a, until you get to that point where things don't change. Okay, um, I can see that. I was wondering if there was any, if there was any property about that. Oh, I'm sure there is. I, I have a. I have a three foot bookshelf of books on mm. chaos theory and the logistics curve. And uh, some of it is extremely deep. There's there are many theorems about uh, the things, for example, that you point out that it takes that when you get close to three, there's uh, it takes longer for the system to settle in. And then you have this uh, bifurcation here and and that the system can quickly get to a, a this situation where you have two uh, two boundaries. So the senior any of the bifurcation. What's that? It, it takes longer. Excuse me. For, sorry for jumping in. I just uh, it it takes longer near any of the bifurcations. I mean, if you sort of looking at two point nine, you have this exponential convergence. And, and a stability property that's clearly lost if you if you took that that nice smooth line from two four to three in your figure and extended it as, as a dotted line all the way through you get yeah. a, a 
a neutrally stable steady state, uh, an unstable steady state, S3. Right. And, and, and so right near it, you have essentially a very, very slow rate of convergence, which goes to zero, the rate of convergence actually at three. And not understanding this phenomenon in a chemical model led me to make a discovery and I later understood it. So it's a sort of humorous story about my misunderstanding this in years gone by. Okay. All right. So now I've already shown you how to compute where this bifurcation occurs. It was a simple first order algebraic equation to figure out where this bifurcation occurs, that is what value of R causes the bifurcation, you have to solve a quadratic. To get this one, you're up to a uh, third order algebraic equation. I'll show you an example of this later. And so what happens is you can calculate this point and these, this value for R and this and so forth. Once you get over here, it's virtually impossible because you have polynomials to the hundredth power that have to be solved, something like that. I'll show you an example of that. All right, so we now have multiple ways to exhibit the behavior of the logistics function. One is the graphical thing that I introduced where we have four stability values and virtually no time spent by the system in between these, these values. You can do it this way by doing iterative computations on, uh, on a spreadsheet, or you can draw it this way. Now, I'm going to show you a, a more detail about what's going on in this gap. So now we're going to go to video number two. And again, you'll see me moving, uh, well, maybe me or maybe somebody I copied, but in any case, somebody's going to be moving the cursor. Once again, here's R ranging from two to four, and here's the logistics result that we've already demonstrated. But now we're going to zoom in. I'm going to draw some rectangles, and when I draw that, I'm now zooming in, and then I zoom back out to draw this, and you see the splitting. Now let me stop this for a second and point some, well, let me stop it right. I want to stop it right here. Notice that as I zoom in, I'm showing you the minimum value and the maximum value of this part of the, that graph. These are the, the, this is the range of R values depicted in this zoom. And you can see structure in here. And I'm just going to keep zooming in. But take note of the R values, because they're eventually going to get extremely close together as we zoom in. Here's that big empty space. And what we find is, this is what I said when, when I said there appears to be a reflection of the full graph, including an empty space there. In this range from 3.806 to 3.883, there's a lot going on here in terms of bifurcations. And then there's this period of relative calm. And then you resume having bifurcations on a, just in every way. So now we're going to zoom in on that little section and zoom in on its little white bar and keep repeat, repeating this process. Now, ultimately, we're going to run out of computer resolution digit, uh, in terms of numeric values. So in fact, let me stop here. You'll see to the left, we have 385, 4068, and over here, 4079. And still, this white bar appears. And we're going to come to a point where the two numbers, the two upper and lower values for R, are, are the same in this display of the numbers. But there's all this structure in here 
that's characteristic of these chaotic systems where the bifurcations just keep repeating and repeating. And there's lots of work has been done. Now, see, we're running out of numeric resolution. So uh, there's been lots of, of work done on the relationship of this behavior of the bifurcations in a chaotic system and things like the um, uh, what am I thinking of? Oh, it, it, what Harold talked about last time, um, the Mandelbrot set, for example, where you have fractal behavior. Okay, here's, here's yet another example. Now, this is not the logistics function. This is a segment of a sine wave. And there's a video. You can you can look at it yourself. We don't have to go through it. it has the same kind of behavior, and we're going to see something very interesting about this in a few minutes. So, all of you have probably heard that there's this idea that butterflies in Bolivia, flapping around, uh, making little turbules in the atmosphere, might. Uh, those turbules might couple to larger scales in the atmosphere and two years later we have a hurricane that we w otherwise would not have had. So there's a, this uh, idea that there's coupling on different spatial and temporal, temporal scales and uh, the idea of the butterfly effect, which depending on how much time we have, let's see how we're doing time-wise. Yeah, okay. We're, I may be able to show you something uh, very specific about butterflies. So there's a few words here about the fields of uh, mathematics and sciences where the implications of chaos are being uh, considered. Uh, I don't want to talk about this today. Okay. Now one of the things we see is if we have this uh, population of rabbits I was talking about, over a period of time, the rabbit population will grow until it's limited by the available resources. For population biologists, there's interest in understanding what happens if you put foxes in the pen with the rabbits. So the fox population grows, the rabbit population dies, and the fox population will stabilize. In fact, it might likely drop in a closed experiment because if the foxes eat all the rabbits, then the foxes will starve to death and both curves will go down. Now here's a, a yet another way. Whoops. Here's a yet another way. This repeats, so I'm going to talk while it's going. Here's another way to look at what happens where we have an analog for time based on the number of iterations we do. And this gets to the question that was asked earlier about how long it takes the system to come to stability. So here's the R value ranging up to four, and it's going to exhibit what we've been seeing in this graph. There's the chaotic behavior, but now it's gonna start over in a second. So if we have a low value of R, we get one output. That's, that represents this line. When we get close to three, we'll see some ripples over time. This is the delay in the system coming to stability. The stability eventually occurs. But when we get to three, now we're bounded by an upper and lower value, and the system oscillates between those two values. And the, those two values spread apart, just like shown here. And we get to, to a certain point, we get well, we get chaos, but now watch this stabilize right there. That's this gap. So let's let it run again. So here we're tracing out to this point. We're about, let's see, we're about right there, and we're coming up on three, and now we're going to get upper and lower bounds. And now we're at 3.1, 3.2, and so forth. Now we're at this point, we're going to get four values. And you can see them in the heights of the picks right there. 
Then we have some chaotic behavior. And right here, watch. Stability and then more chaos. So there, there are regions in here where the system has boundaries, but doesn't have this chaotic behavior that we've seen. So here I stop that movie and I'm just showing you that at r equals just something other, th under than th other than 3, but smaller than 3, takes a while to, for the system to settle. At 3.3, it takes a while for it to become what I would call stable. That is that the two boundaries are established and maintained. And here we have four values, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so forth. And now this is interesting, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. We have periodicity, that is a stable value close to, to this one. And then there's a period of chaos. This occurs at r equals 3.8282. And then we have a period of stability, but we do have the emergence of chaos at this value. I'm probably not going to go into, I, there's some things I want to show you, but this is for people who want to just understand the, the math involved. We can predict whether we're going to get stability or not. It depends on the angle at which the logistics curve encounters the straight line. If, it's big, if this angle is bigger than 90 degrees, the system will settle into a single point. If, the, if that angle is smaller than 90 degrees, we tend to get these uh, periods of searching. So there's some arithmetic here you might want to look at. Okay, and at, well, Here's, here's what I was talking about before. If you're trying to calculate the value of R at which the system bifurcates, you would put in a value, a starting point, let's say x1, and x2 depends on x1, and then we're going to take x2 and put it back into the logistics equation. So I put it in here and here, and then if you expand this out and do some factoring, you see that this the value of the point at which this occurs is, a, is cubic in x. So you have to solve a cubic equation. And this quickly gets more complicated. The cubic equation, of course, can be solved. But as I was pointing out, eventually you get to just ridiculously complicated higher order algebraic problems. Now, I'm skipping some of this because there are some things I want to show you. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so um, you were talking about how when, when it's stable, if you put in like any value, any initial value, it'll still come to the same point. Right. Is that still true with chaos? Like no. Is that relation? No. So if you, in the chaotic case, the starting point and the end result, the chaotic gibberish you get, um, you don't, the thing doesn't, it never settles into a repeating system. So uh, the answer is no. It, it, well, let's say it this way. When the system is chaotic, it matters what your starting point is. Okay, so I'm, I want to rush ahead because we have yeah about 10 minutes left uh, you'll see if you go back and look at this in detail you can see uh, a number of numerical examples I've put in now let's talk about something called a Chua circuit uh, there's a professor Cal Berkeley maybe who uh, you can watch uh, I think it's him talking about his invention which I will show you this circuit, which you can make out of uh, $20 worth of electronics, or at this point, probably $5 worth of electronics, requires an op amp and some resistors. And, you know, you can see it's pretty simple. This thing will produce an audio signal that you can hook to a speaker and you can hear it just making a pure tone. And after a while, it will become chaotic and it will stay chaotic for a while 
depending on how you tune this capacitor and this resistor, you'll have intervals of chaos and intervals of stability. And when I saw this a few years ago, when I first wrote this lecture, I was immediately taken back to something I experienced as a graduate student in the 60s. We had an RF generator. Uh, and people were using it to do some kind of experiment in the physics department. But they had these intervals where the thing wouldn't work. It just went completely berserk. Instead of putting out a pure tone, it would be produce what we would, in this context, call a chaotic signal. Frequency changing, amplitude changing. And then it would settle down and resume producing a, a uh, pure RF signal. And there was a prize offered in the physics department for anybody who could figure out why this circuit kept behaving that way. The, the timing of this was in the 19, like 1968 or so. And uh, chaos theory of the form I've just been describing to you was just in its infancy. Ed Lorenz did his early work on chaos in uh, right about that time. Nobody I knew knew anything about chaos, never had heard of it, had never thought about it. But I'm convinced now that the RF generator that uh, a one of our colleagues, maybe a graduate student or a professor had built, had some of the properties of this circuit and would produce periods of RF signal that were what was desired and then periods of chaos. So let me keep going ahead. There are many functions that exhibit this chaotic behavior. Here's x times e to the x. And you see it has for and this axis once again is equivalent to the value of r. So you have sort of like chaotic behavior and then for some range of values the system will only put out one value and then there's bifurcations like we saw with the logistics function. Here's the tent function up and down. Same kind of thing. It doesn't look the same. In fact it looks quite different but it has this structure of bifurcations and areas where bifurcations are numerous. Here's one where it goes up and down and up and so all of these have some features of the logistics function and its chaotic behavior. Like this looks kind of like the logistics function. This is x times 1 minus x squared. Looks very similar to the, at least up to here, looks very similar to the logistics function. But there's something very interesting coming on this topic. Here I'm comparing three different shapes. The logistics function is here on the right, the sine function here, and the tent function here. And here we have, here it's called s, but this is the same value that we've been calling r, 0 to 4. And you notice these bifurcation structures appear at different, over different ranges of r. Now, now comes Feigenbaum. Feigenbaum, formerly of uh, Los Alamos National Lab, he died uh, maybe two years ago. He noticed something very interesting. He says, I'm looking at the bifurcation values for R. And you see they get closer together. The first one's here and then here and there. They're getting closer and closer together. And he studied, once again, having to do a lot of algebra because to get the bifurcation points out here you have to solve polynomials of enormous order. Nonetheless he persisted and he came up with this value now called Fe the Feigenbaum number where he says pick any bifurcation value for R and pick the next val value Take the difference and divide by the one. Uh, let's do it this way. If you pick this one, pick the one on the right and the one on the left as n minus 1, n minus 2, and n. Pick those values of r that pertain. Make this ratio and explore the density 
uh, how that value, how delta changes as you get to higher and higher values of R. And what he found is in the limit, this limit as you go to the highest orders that you can compute, you get this number, 4.669. And it turns out, for reasons nobody understands, that all three of these logistic functions have a Feigenbaum number of 4.669. In fact, all bifurcating functions of this type that exhibit chaos and bifurcation all have this number as a characteristic. As far as I know, there's no, there's no explanation for this. Nobody knows how to calculate this from first principles. And yet, well, here I've done the calculation for the logistics and sine functions. Now, some of you may be familiar with phase diagrams uh, having to do with the position and velocity of a system. For example, here's a damped harmonic oscillator. An undamped harmonic oscillator would start with at zero position with some velocity and just make a circle and keep doing that forever. But a real pendulum, for example, would be damped by air resistance or whatever, friction, and it spirals in. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about a phase diagram. Now, back in the 1930s, when vacuum tubes was the technology of the day, Dufeng, I think a German, studied the stability of electronic circuits built with certain kinds of, of, um, of vacuum tubes and wrote down a differential equation I will show you that has to do with the phase diagram and the purity of the signal produced by a circuit, for example, if you built an oscillator using vacuum tubes. So we have a phase diagram here if you, there's, there's some characteristic parameter gamma that characterizes how the system is working. And for this value of gamma, the circuit will produce something that looks like a sine wave. You can see it's not quite a sine wave. Its phase diagram is like this, but its phase diagram repeats reliably. If you raise the gamma value here to 0.28, now you get double the frequency and you can see something's happening kind of like the bifurcations of the logistics function but this is stable if you watch this system it will follow these trajectories in phase space if you raise the gamma value again still stable here it's even bigger still stable a little bit wonky it doesn't look like sine waves anymore but then for a value of gamma equal 0.5, you get chaos. The shapes are all different from one cycle to the next. You get dips and peaks and just unpredictable behavior. But then if we raise gamma again, back to a stable phase diagram, if you watch this thing, this, uh, this circuit, it just keeps repeating. So actually, uh, this you can play with this. I think the way this works is this is a Mathematica representation of the Dufing equation. And you can see this effect because you get to choose by grabbing this slider. Go to YouTube, this YouTube link, and you can play with the slider or watch somebody else play with it. And you can see there's, a, there's an interval of chaos right in the middle of this thing being able to produce signals. So here's Dufing's equation. Looks like a harmonic oscillator, except it's got this, well, it's got this X term and a cubic term. And this was a big deal back in the 1930s, I think, when Dufing did his work, because that was the way you managed electrical signals, was with vacuum tubes that had nonlinear behavior. So here's more detail on Dufing's thing. That there's an interval of values where the system is just unpredictable. Now I'm going to hurry up because we're, we're going to run over time. Now, I mentioned butterflies earlier. This is called the Lorenz attractor, and you can see it in detail at this YouTube link. This that looks like a, looks kind of like a butterfly. It has nothing to do with a butterfly in Bolivia. It happens to be 
the three-dimensional phase diagram of a system called the Lorentz attractor. And I'm going to show you this example of a Lorentz attractor built out of a bicycle wheel. It, well, let me just say this. The Lorentz attractor has this set of features that if you have three parameters of interest and they, you're going to, interested in the differential equation describing each, you'll see that each depends on the others. That is, x depends on y and x, y depends on x, y, and z, and z depends on x, y, and z. And if you try to solve this group of coupled differential equations, you get this uh, stability effect. Here's, here's the Lorentz attractor. But let's, let's look at the bike wheel because it has many of the features of the Lorentz attractor. So let me tell you what's going on here. There's a water pipe up here you will see in a second. Water coming out. Plastic cup. Plastic cups around the wheel and each plastic cup has a hole in the bottom. So we start the water and whatever cup happens to wander under the water, get some water and the system is just going. But remember, water is coming out of the bottom of each cup. So the cup changes, I mean, the wheel changes direction. And then it's about to enter an interval where it just keeps going in the same direction, but it's going to change direction again. And predicting, this gets to Liam's question about if the system's chaotic, can you predict? Does it matter how you start? And the answer is yes, it matters. Um, so we're close to a point where this, this water wheel is going to change direction right there. And you cannot predict when that's going to happen. Now, it turns out the differential equations I just showed you are uh, uh, Lorenz's equations are can be used to describe this experiment. Let's get back to our, and so we have, um, bear with me, oh yeah. So here are the equations, again, slightly different form, and the system, a system will follow this kind of weird um, pyramidic phase space thing. In fact, if you look in, uh, here's some code that describes this, which is sometimes called Lorenz's butterfly. The system in a three-dimensional representation of phase space will stay on that surface. Oh, here's the Chua circuit. You can buy a kit if you're interested. And Here's the phase diagram. This is this is the water wheel again. Let's do this. Let's do this one. So you have cars, and they're going to travel in Mini Coopers, yeah, uh, travel in phase space, and this is what is sometimes called a butterfly. That the system, the car will stay in this part of the phase space, the velocity and position curve. It'll stay there for a while, and then it shifts to a whole nother place in the phase space. That is, its velocity and position relationships appear to be stable here, but then it'll come around and switch back to the original one. So these are examples that Lorenz and his students did to show that trying to predict weather patterns would be difficult. Okay, and so I have, there's also some stuff here about the Mandelbrot set because it does have a relationship to what we've been talking about, uh, particularly if you look at the Mandelbrot set in the complex plane. So here, I've, there's that's my handwriting. I've done some calculations about how you pre, how you calculate 
whether you put a black dot or a blue dot or a, or a white dot because oh and here's the relationship here's the logistics function and its bifurcation properties these these orange lines are the points of bifurcation and you can see they have a relationship to the Mandelbrot set there's lots of math about this out there there's Mandelbrot who I think Harold was a colleague of so and there's references so uh, thank you for letting me go over my allotted time I'd be happy to try to answer questions if you have any I have a question yeah. um, uh, somewhat facetiously uh, what's it good for I mean uh, it seems like uh, it's nice to know that some things are chaotic and we can't predict but can you can you get value out of it? I mean, can you use it yes. to predict something or? Most certainly. And let me give you an example. And I, I wonder if I have it. I uh, wonder if I have it here. Uh, the so, example I'm thinking of, I'm going to describe to you because I don't see it here. Um, it has to do with the design of airplane wings. Uh, there's a, there's a professor, Professor Steve Strogatz at Cornell University teaches a, a class on this topic, a dynamical systems. And in there, he has a short video of a airplane in flight, a small, like a two seater. And it's just flying along and maybe 125 miles an hour. And the pilot accelerates to a slightly higher velocity. And the wings start bending in an inappropriate way when you're airborne. And he speeds up a little bit and now they're just shaking like nobody's business and then he increases the velocity again and stability ensues so for mechanical designers who are concerned about this kind of uh, intervals of mechanical instability in a mechanical system or an electrical system uh, their knowledge of how to solve a important problem is important. And that important problem is how to look at the design mathematics and make sure that you never have to operate at this value of gamma because you'll shake your airplane apart and the pilot will be killed. So that's an example he brings up. I'm not recalling. Uh, in detail, other things he mentioned, but there's lots and lots of concern about systems that are designed, electrical systems, mechanical systems, that have these hidden chaotic domains where the, in the case of the airplane, the velocity matters, whether the wings are going to break off the airplane and kill everybody involved. So, so you're saying so, then that the so value I, I, would, I, would, I would like to add put in one one thing before that which is heart rhythm so i've got oh, a yeah. really, i've got a really strange heart rhythm and it is pretty much described by your chaotic theory so every now and then something happens that is got to be described by chaos so i've been to cardiologists and that would be a really good description if somebody could say if you did this then, then this cardiac uh, appearance or, or what happened. Right. And so and the math that you're talking about looks, everything you showed looks very much like an EKG. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here's another okay. example. And this is uh, the onset of turbulent flow. There's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of interest in uh, how the stability of uh, fluid flow and airflow uh, transitions from laminar to turbulent flow and this chaos, th chaos theory is uh, a part of that, the modern approach to dealing with that. But, but it seems like what you're saying is that the value is understanding chaos theory so you can design a system that doesn't exhibit it. Right. Um, but, but, but there's not like, there are systems that are chaotic that we have to live with and there aren't any tools to better I don't know, I'd say predict, but you can't predict it if it's chaotic, right? So uh, there's not really 
<laughs> there's not like somehow, I don't know, there's, there's no, for a system that's chaotic, and you're stuck with like the weather, it doesn't necessarily help you to do that. You just know that it's chaotic. Yeah. Well, here's one I would say, let me go back to, uh, you guys are still seeing my screen, right? Yes. So here's, if you're a, 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 a rancher who grows mink, you don't want this. You do not want uh, a, a, pair, a mink population that is so um, eager to breed and successful at breeding that when you go to visit the pen, you, you don't know if you're going to have this fraction of the maximum population or this fraction. It would be nice if you had, if you designed the system so that you could count on always being at a population you desired. But if the system is oscillating like this, where the population crashes and then rebuilds quickly, you never know what you're going to get. So from a point of view of uh, agricultural system or something like that, um, Ed? Yes. Let me on throw this two graph, when you were talking about the rabbit population, on my mind, all that I could think of for, for a few minutes at that time was the coronavirus population, Yeah. how it's exploding or not. And I mean, they used to talk about this, there's an R naught value, which was actually how fast it propagated through the population, the infectivity. Um, and I wonder if there are some things, but because they were always, they were never talking about a chaotic system. They were just talking about as if it's going to go forward. But we know that, uh, you know, as more and more people get infected or build some resistance to it, it kind of, it's like you're, you're running out of resource. Right. Let, let, let uh, me comment on that, if I can. Well, and go ahead, Harold. Yeah. First, just on the use of chaos, if anyone has ever looked at making bread, you want to mix all the ingredients. And for those of us who had bread machines, there were elaborate design things to get good mixing. And if you want to get good mixing in industrial processes, you want it to be chaotic. You don't want to have sort of areas which are primarily one and primarily the other. So you want this behavior. Another curious thing in the heart is that when your atrium your left atrium contracts, it sends blood into the left ventricle. And in fact, the shape of the pulse of the blood, the, the size of the mitral valve and so on are designed. So the flow becomes turbulent and pressure hits, the, 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 the slug of blood coming in tries to hit lots of the wall and preload it. And roughly 20% of your heart output comes of your contraction strength, sorry, comes from the preloading of the LV wall by this, this, this chaotic blood flow coming in. So that's actually important. And, and then the, the comment on the weather is it's short-term predictable. I mean, that's the characteristic of chaos vis-a-vis -vis randomness is that you can make, that's why you can get pretty good five to seven day forecasts or the wonderful hurricane forecast you mentioned but every day you want to do better requires an enormous amount of extremely additional precision. And that's what limits you. And, and, and it was a wonderful talk yet. I, I just loved it, especially the videos. And I've got to show a few of them next time I, I teach this and also build that Lorentz wheel. It's just, it's just wonderful. Well, let me recommend to anybody who's, who's raising questions. I'm looking for something while I talk. Uh, anybody who's raising these questions, uh, if you're interested in more information, take a look at uh, Steve Strogatz's lectures. Uh, I think there are 25 lectures uh, from the class he teaches at Cornell on dynamical systems. I, here's, by the way, this is for another lecture I'm about to give at the end of the month. Hurricane prediction uh, dating back, uh, let's say if you're interested in the 72-hour prediction of the eye of the hurricane, its location, back in the 1970s, uh, the, the excursion was in hundreds of nautical miles. You, this is the actual data. The, the 72 hour prediction now is better than the 
24-hour prediction was back then. So things have gotten better, even though you're dealing with a big, complicated thing that we, you know, barely understand, namely a hurricane. So, uh, oh, actually, we're we're at the point now where the 96-hour prediction of the location, I think it's, uh, sorry, this got in the way, uh, predicting ahead uh, two weeks or something, it's now better at 96 hours than it was to predict, uh, you know, 50 years ago for 24 hours. So things have definitely improved, but uh, you know, there's more work to do. Hey, Ed, it, it yes. looks like it looks like uh, one of the one of the kids has a question. Okay. Go ahead, Henry. Unmute yourself. What, what website did you use for those cool graphs that moved and stuff? Yeah, they're all really cool. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. So, Bruce, Bruce, tell me, what was his question? Uh, it kind of broke well, up. He said, he asked, what uh, what uh, website did you use for those cool graphs that you that you showed? Uh, oh, yeah, there, there are links. Uh, is he, I wonder what he's talking about. Is he talking about the where, I, where you see me selecting values or something like that? Probably where you where the thing is. Yeah, wobbling. there should be there's references all through here. Uh, okay. But how do I access that? Oh, uh, okay. So Henry, these are on the internet. Um, you can if you can find the link. I'm I'm right now looking for the one of the examples but there should be a yeah here it is it's written right there are you going to send the powerpoint and, yeah so take a look at the bruce take a look at the powerpoint i mm -hmm. kept the link right here yeah okay and uh you might be able to you might have to scratch around oh actually i did you a favor it's here it's clickable here okay got it okay so, so you'll 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 send us that PowerPoint, or I'm going to send Bruce a link okay. to this presentation because I I don't have emails for all the people who participate, right? And Bruce has the uh, the full roster. And the other okay. thing I'm going to do is put the um, I'll I'll build a little folder because it'll have the videos because the videos are not embedded here. That's why. We have a, this a little reminder to me to show video two and so forth. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to say. Any other questions? Did Did you discuss how Lorenz discovered the the chaos? Did you mention that? Uh, I did not go through the history. I mean, it he he had run a program, and oh, he yeah, wanted yeah. to run it for more data. He took the last data from his screen say, 100 iterations back, started again, and observed that when he reran it, he got different answers, because in those days, you did not display all of the digits used in the calculation. Right. And, and there were fewer digits in the calculation. Yeah. I mean, these days, if you run the same code that he had created in Mathematica, where it will keep, I think, up to 256 digits, in its computations or something like that. 256 bits, binary digits. Yeah, so it will it will keep track of enormous detail in every calculation. The square root of two will have hundreds of digits in it. Um, it would he, he might not have noticed the issue because it would have taken a long time to see the the yeah. the effect occur. But yeah, he was he was uh, oh. And for those with a little bit of mathematical background, at the end of my lecture notes, this here's an example of using um, Lagr or Lagrangian mechanics to get the the equations of motion of the double pendulum. In case you're interested in doing that problem, uh, oh. there's plenty of people have show, have things on inter on uh, YouTube how to build a really nice double pendulum with high quality bearings, where you give it a shake and it'll just go for minutes. <laughs> oh man i'm wondering something here yeah um so i believe that uh the n body problem is 
chaotic for n greater than two. Um, and I'm thinking about the spaces in the rings of Saturn and wondering if there's any relationship. Uh, there probably is, uh, because uh, perhaps you know that there, there are these observations of uh, helical shapes in some of the rings. Um, uh, oh, the, the Cassini mission got close enough to actually look in the space between the rings, and all the rings are not concentric circles. There are some, nobody knows why, where the, the cluster of dust and little granules are not in a plane. They are out of the plane of the ring that they yeah. they're in, and uh, so I can't answer your question with any specificity. But I'm sure uh, there's uh, you know there are people thinking about these things in terms of uh, the dynamics of gravitational effects, where you know every particle in the universe is being tugged on by everything else, and uh, there there may be chaotic behavior almost anywhere. Let me give you an example about this, Peter, a different, simpler. If you look at the asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, there are essentially no asteroids of period four years and six years. And there are fewer when you get a rational relationship to Jupiter's period. Right. Because right. of the interactions, it's three bodies, the sun, Jupiter, and the asteroids. And just like in the double pendulum, energy is exchanged between the pendulums. Energy is exchanged between Jupiter and the asteroids in the system. And of course, the asteroids are so light, any amount of energy deorbits them. Mm. So it's a, 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 the, the uh, rings of Saturn, I, I simply have no idea, although I teach astronomy regularly. So thanks. It's a wonderful question. Thanks. Thanks. I'm actually, oh, yeah, here's what Harold's talking about. Hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. So you have the resonances, and then you have this uh, weird stuff where, for example, in front and behind Jupiter, there are clusters of asteroids that are in resonance, the so-called Greeks and the Trojans. And uh, th this is uh, an area of a lot of interest to, to go there and learn about those asteroids because they're probably as old as the solar system. They've been trapped there from, from the earliest time of Jupiter cleaning up its orbit. So, yeah, there's all sorts of mysteries like this. I, I say again, I have a, a bookshelf here at my home with about three feet of, of books, uh, many by Springer Verlag, about chaos theory and its many applications. Uh, I may have missed a whole bunch of stuff here, but... Are you saying that this is also chaos theory? The asteroids? Uh, I wouldn't put it in the same category. This has to do with the orbital resonances. But still, they started from a strange same place. Yeah. Ended up in different uh, places. No, it, it, the, the mechanism is the same as the double pendulum, essentially. Yeah, that is true. Right. That, it, that's isn't, all. Isn't it governed by square roots? No, it, it's governed by sure, like double, you know. Uh, what you do is you ask yourself essentially how many conserved quantities there are, like energy and momentum and angular momentum and things like this. And, and if you have two bodies, you have enough that the motion is regular, even without any friction to stabilize it. And if you have three, you don't. And that's a little yeah. related. Is, is there a squared or squared? Uh, Gravity is nonlinear. The fact that it's an inverse square law force is enough to do it. If, if you had a similar number of, and for the pendulum, the key is those little uh, sines and cosines. If you had masses and springs, you don't get chaotic motion if you have perfect springs. So it's the same nonlinearity Ed mentioned that shows up, the Taylor expansion. Once you hit the quadratic terms, bam, you're gonna get it. And what is that the planet spring that in? 
uh, the planet's gravity, if you think the gravitational force is one over R squared. And so that lets you get these, these irregular resonances. Yeah, so here I'm so showing. Mine, it's some sort of an R squared thing. Yeah, the Taylor expansion would have an R squared. Although it's, it, with, with the inverse square law force, you do a little better with a, a different expansion. The key is exactly as Ed mentioned at the beginning, thanks Ed, nonlinear. Yeah, this, on the left, you're looking at the, the phase diagram of this uh, double pendulum that I'm illustrating right now. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it takes a long time for this thing to repeat. I think this is an undamped example. Uh, this will keep going. Um, well, then, like that. What's that? Aren't these the Lassie's figures or something like that? that yes, a, yes, a Liz's you. Yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this looks like a damped case because you see the trace is not repeating. It's filling this space. Uh, yes. Rational flow on a torus. Uh, someone's theorem. I forget who I. Yeah, here's this got to be start. I, I was doing beginning to learn math when this went on, I and mean, it was just exciting. Yeah, uh, numerical solution. Yeah, see, the, the equations of motion for that thing are nuts. And um, here, here are the angles. Uh, yeah, we're 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 wandering way off of where we're supposed to be. Um, any other questions that I might be able to answer? Why don't you um, stop sharing and we'll we'll uh, kind of wrap up here. Okay. Well, thanks for all the great questions. And yeah, uh, I'm I'm just amazed anybody uh, could keep up. Uh, except I'm I'm not surprised with Harold. He's he's uh, off the charts. But like Ed, uh, yeah. You guys, uh, uh, it's fun to, 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 to just see, see you in action, frankly. And thank Peter, you. And Peter's, Peter, are you, are you, are you going to be able to come up for air and maybe do another talk for us sometime? Please. Um, <laughs> not, not soon. Well, we're covered through May 5th now, so <laughs> it, it'll be out there somewhere. Can I make one comment on COVID before we quit? Because I was actually... I spoke again in a session on that today at the Physical Society. Uh, if you go to a detailed model, like uh, the Los Alamos group is doing, if you have really all the details, you do get some of this chaotic behavior that you've seen. The, the data that we look at, when we look at the number of cases, is of course a highly integrated or average model. I look at the total number in the great state of Massachusetts and in the US to get a sense of what's going on. And that smoothing gets rid of the chaos. Yeah, if we, if we wait 10 years, track all the cases for 10 years and then go back and look, we, we will probably see unexpected eruptions in cases and hospitalizations that are associated with these things I, I was talking about when I was talking about rabbit populations. Yeah. Just suddenly out of nowhere. And it's because of social behavior, among other things, where people uh, decide, well, everybody's been inoculated. I'm going to now engage in risky behavior. I'm, I'm sure somewhere out there in the literature is a paper that has the word chaos and the acronym AIDS in it. That is, uh, people have been studying the AIDS epidemic for 25 or 30 years now, looking at the dynamics of it and looking for and finding chaotic intervals where unexpected levels occurred, either low or high. Yeah, from a barbershop convention. <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, May and Anderson, 1987. Uh, I just know it because I cited it today. Had 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 actually explored the role of super spreaders in it and the key key import of stop of of, of dealing with super spreaders, and actually brought a fair bit of control by spreading this knowledge to the uh, bathhouses in San Francisco. Oh yeah. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, I'm pretty much done for tonight.
So I will see you next time. I'll be a listener and eager to learn more from you guys. Yeah, it's going to be a good one as usual. So see you next week, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, that was great. Ed, thank you so much. Okay. See you Thank soon. you very much. Thanks, Ed. Great okay, talk, Ed. Bye.